This came about as a result of uh, a collaboration between Life Theatre here in Newcastle and Soho Theatre in London. Uh, about a year ago, we did a play called A Walk on Part, which was the adaptation of uh, Chris Mullins' political diaries by Michael Chaplin. And the guys from Soho came up to see that and said, oh, could you bring that to Soho? And thus began uh, a collaborative relationship. And, th and that play went really well. It sold out twice. And indeed, it's going to come back, and Live and Soho are going to open it again the week after next in a small West End theatre for a, a run. But Steve Marmion, the uh, artistic director of Soho, said, we both obviously thought it was a, a really good relationship because the play was so, so successful and, uh, and audiences really enjoyed it. He said, it would be really good if we could create something together. Um, and he had a notion that as Walk on Park looked back at recent political history, he was interested in creating a piece that looked forward, uh, a new political uh, piece of theatre that looked forward. And so he had the, 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 the concept of exploring the notion of utopia. And uh, I was really swept up by Steve's enthusiasm because he wanted to, re to create a really diverse and a really unconventional and original piece of theatre. And he said, wouldn't it be great if we approached a whole gang of writers uh, to contribute and, 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 and integrate that into, a, into an overall vision? And so we approached writers that were connected to both theatre companies. Uh, Simon Stevens and Michael Chaplin were, were uh, Michael from, from this, this company, were the senior writers. But we also approached a lot of younger emerging writers. And also some comedians and musicians and indeed politicians uh, to actually explore the, no the notion of, uh, of utopia. And something that Steve and I were very keen on, uh, looking at some of the better aspects of the human nature. Because uh, my favourite dramas over the years, and I know Steve shares this, have always been when humanity is, is seen at, at its best and it touch, touches the audience hearts and minds and souls. And so we set about uh, creating the project by bringing writers and artists from both sides. And the final ingredient uh, under Steve's uh, conception was that we must bring a really diverse and interesting cast. And I think we've certainly got that because <coughs> before you we've got an incredibly multi-talented bunch of performers. Um, there's a couple of Geordies here, uh, one who's been uh, uh, found a founder member of Live Theatre, David over, over there, uh, and, and Laura here, who is an actress who's been on my radar uh, for, like for, like <laughs> yeah, yeah. for many years, and I'm really glad that she's, she's come here. And, and a whole gang of other uh, uh, performers too. Um, Pam and Toby there, and uh, uh, Rufus and Sophia. And I'm writing thinking, I'm going to sort of throw it and ask, ask some questions to you uh, now. Um, I'm writing thinking that this is your first piece of, of theatre, is that right, Sophia? Yeah, it's, well, I, I did one play when I was very, very young at school, but um, yeah, this is my first sort of professional, real professional job on the stage. And you've worked extensively in film and television, yeah. so what made you want to jump into theatre? Well, I decided that I wanted to have a go at it, and um, just uh, last November I took part in um, the 24-hour plays at the Old Vic, um, and which is a very scary experience to just have well, 24 hours to put on a play, and, um, and that's where I met Steve Marmion, the director of this, and I knew after that experience that I wanted to work with him again, um, and so that's how it came about. Right. And uh, Toby, I, you know, a, a lot of casting directors tell me you're one of the hottest young actors on the London circuit, <laughs> and I, I can uh, <laughs> certainly uh, verify that, and uh, those of you who've seen him will know that, and those of you who've seen him tonight will, will also uh, appreciate that. What made you, you know, I would imagine there's lots of things that you could do, but what made you actually, what appealed to you about Utopia in this particular project? Um, for me, it's, it's just, it's something that's so distant, but yet so reachable. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Um, utopia. Yeah, Utopia. It's yeah. so distant, but yet so reachable. Um, and it's, and I like, I've always liked surreal theatre, theatre that's not realistic, that's not too realistic, theatre that takes you into new places, new worlds, because, I mean, I, I feel that's where actors are at their best, when they're using their imagination and creating things. Um, so, for me, this project <laughs> was very much an exploration for me, and a chance for me to try different things, you know, 
you have clowning in it, which to be fair, honestly, before I actually accepted this job, I was um, about to take up some clowning sessions. So it just came at the right time. I was like, yep, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, an interesting thing to point out is that none of us had seen a script before yeah, we were yeah. offered this or job. Maybe a bit, <laughs> maybe a bit, but not a whole one. Yeah. And yeah. Um, we also, well, me personally, I'd said to Steve when I met him to talk about it, um, I said there's just a couple of things major things you need to know about me. I don't do singing and I don't do dancing, not even at home or in the shower. And then the script arrived and of course we've got musical numbers yeah. and dance numbers yeah. and stuff. So that's been a, a big challenge yeah. for, for some yeah. of us that ha haven't done the, the musical yeah. bits before. And Pam, I think you and I are uh, possibly senior here. We've done lots of uh, plays. This is a really unconventional project. Oh, totally. Uh, normally you get a script and you approach and, and uh, you decide, oh, this actress or that actor would be good, and you approach their agent and you, you send them the script and then you have a meeting. How did, how did this happen for you? How did this project... I, th I think you said that Erica Weinman, who runs yeah. um, Northern Stage, yeah. had suggested me. Yeah. I'd done a very weird American play with her in London. So I think well, yeah, she, yes, yeah, yeah. she obviously thought I was into the weird. <laughs> but I only saw, I did see a bit of script, yeah. a bit of the um, Ruth. Ruth is a, an 88-year-old ex-politician. Um, and I saw a little bit of that, so the scene with, with Bella and Ruth. And um, that's all. And that seemed fairly conventional to start. <laughs> and then at the end of this very short meeting, um, Steve said something like, oh, that there might be song, but he kind of mumbled that. So, <laughs> and then the rest started happening. So yeah. it grew, and it has gone on growing. Yeah. I mean, there are 13 different pieces within the overall production. 13 different voices, 13 different pieces that all reflect on Utopia. And Steve, who actually conceived it and also edited it, uh, actually juxtaposed the, and, and cut across all the pieces and divided them up. And it really, that's, that's one of the things that makes it so uh, unconventional. And it's certainly something I've not worked on, uh, a project like this, for, for many, many years. But I was kind of swept up by Steve's enthusiasm, and also the fact that we'd had a good, such a good relationship between the, the, the two companies, and I was very keen that we sustained that. And indeed, we will, we're already talking about some other projects that we will be developing together. Rufus, this is, am I right in thinking this is also your first uh, theatre, straight theatre show? Yeah, as a grown-up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, from about the age of two, I knew I wanted to be an actor. And then at 17, I knew what I wanted to be was a professional alcoholic and ladies' man. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that, that rather got in the way of the acting. Uh -huh. So um, <laughs> I, I went to college and there was a, a woman who was a failed actress who was the um, drama teacher. And the message that she handed down was basically, don't bother. So I didn't. I went and worked in PR and then I drank heavily. And worked in the science museum, teaching kids science, and drank heavily. And then I started stand up, and I drank heavily. Then I got married, and I've got kids, so of course I have to drink heavily. Um, <laughs> this is really just a, a break from that to uh, my liver recover. Very good. And, and what, what, I mean, of all the projects you could have done, what, what made you? I mean, no, well, I, I mean, I skipped a bit there. I skipped a bit about a bloke called David Proudlock who. Uh, I went to an all boys school until I was 13 and then I went to this school called French and Heights that um, was a mixed school, no uniforms, you called the teachers by their first name, no religious education, no Latin, anything like that, but it was a private school, uh, which I couldn't afford to go to. Um, and the drama teacher went, you're alright kiddo, so he sorted out a scholarship and I could stay there um, and, and I basically was a kid that lived at the drama block and in that time read... Shakespeare, Godber, Brecht, um, Chekhov, you know, I, I played Puck, I was in musicals, we did pantomimes, I painted flats, you know, I was like, I, I was totally in it, it was my whole life. So then I meet Steve Marmion, who says we're going to do this really high concept thing about utopia, it'll be the rebirth of political theatre, and it was like he'd reached into my 14-year-old soul and just screamed, this is everything you ever dreamed of. Yeah. 
And, and so, yeah, I signed up, and then I read the scripts, and I was like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's certainly reached into my soul as well, with this enthusiasm. But, uh, no, but I mean, it's, it is that, isn't it? I mean, it's, yeah. you're talking about utopia. The thing for me is always, and, and I think for all of us, it's, it's just where you've got so many competing visions, it seems to me the danger is that you end up with something that by the end is just, may as well have been the same as, you know, turning on the telly and just having white noise vomited at you. Because it's, it's so disparate that you don't really walk out of it any the wiser or any, you know, there's a degree to which theatre can ask you questions, but if all it's done is ask you 5,000 questions, you're so lost to know what the answer could possibly be. And yet, what's been interesting is over the course of actually making the play and being a part of the play is that we've all been a part of kind of refining that journey towards its conclusion where I think now, you know, when we get to, and I know that people here haven't seen it yet, so I'm not going to say specifically, but when we get to the end now, I, I find it very hard not to cry. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I agree, it's a, it's a very uplifting and in a way achieves some of the objectives that we set out because whilst the ambition was to be utopian and, and look at humanity, the writers continually came up against the notion of the impossibility of, of the human uh, kind to, to actually really embrace uh, uh, the notion of utopia and run, run with it. But what came back constantly was this belief that humanity uh, can be uh, at its best can be very very beautiful and I think those of you who've seen it I hope you you agree and those you will see it tonight you will see a very touching and beautiful ending um, Laura tell us a bit about how tell, you're you're from Sunderland yes tell us a bit about how you came you you you, you entered the profession as a last from Sunderland tell us a bit about how you ended up here uh, I ended up here well first of all this is my first job at home which is brilliant for me. I've worked in London and I've worked, lived there for 11 years and so I feel very proud and another reason for being very proud is that um, from a young age I went to this amateur theatre in Sunderland called the Royalty oh, Theatre. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so, and my dad was a chairman there for a bit, Chris Alphonstone, and he was an artistic director and he, he directed lots of amateur theatre stuff and from God knows how high I was, I used to sit in the stalls and watch him direct. Um, plays and things and yeah my mum was also involved and I just I really loved the people that I was around and I liked the idea of um, researching so many different things and being able to try on different people's shoes and you know it got really exciting to see what it was like to be someone else for a bit and I was really encouraged by my dad because my dad had always wanted to be um, an actor but was told to get a proper job and he saw it in me that I was determined and throughout the years did a bit on the royalty and and did stuff in Sunderland and and got encouraged really from there and was shoved off to London because I wanted to but yeah and um, went and did the whole kind of drama school route which was really quite scary because I moved at 18 from Sunderland to London and it was slightly overwhelming and it took me about four years to get used to London but I'm um, Settling there now, thank God. But yeah, so I'm doing really, really well, and I'm really delighted that you've finally uh, come back to yeah, North East. Great. And on behalf of London, may I say we're just about getting used to you. <laughs> <laughs> was that the language barrier? Uh, yeah, even barely understand word. <laughs> uh, David, we haven't we haven't heard from you. How, how have you ended up here on the stage tonight? <laughs> you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, how far do you want to go back? Yeah, well, Davy is well. Davy's a founder of of, 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 of the theatre, but Davy was in a, a show that we we started here called The Pippin Painters, and Steve went to see uh, David in The Pippin Painters and uh, said, "I'm doing this 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 play that has clowns in it." And David Whitaker is one of the best clowns I've seen on London stage for a long time. Do you think he'd be interested in doing the show? And as David just said. I said, why don't you ask him? And he did. Um, and, he, and you came, uh, David, I asked you to sing a song. Just tell us a bit about how you, what happened at the audition, because that was quite interesting. When you, it wasn't so much an audition, because no, was Steve just, was keen I to think it was just to prove that to play the piano and sing a bit, basically, wasn't it? Because I suppose always, so. But it was all, a, you'd already seen it. Well, it's a lovely song. It was a beautiful it's, uh, song. Alice Clasco. Was it actually involved, was it 
part of a show, or is it just one of, I can't remember. It's a beautiful song, and it's, it was penned by Alex Glasgow, it was yeah. a, in, a, in a play I did many years ago called uh, Tales from the Backyard by Alan Plater, who was a, a long-term That's term, right. term collaborator with Alex, yeah. I wasn't in that. No, you weren't. No. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, David came and sang, his, sang that song, and I think what song was it? it was called A Wild Utopian Dream. Oh. There you go. Just before, yes. yeah, it's in three yeah. seven. Just before the uh, yeah, the interval. Just, just before, no, I won't. I won't say just before one because you haven't seen it yet. <laughs> <laughs> As people are keen already voluntarily asking questions, could, uh, let's let's throw it open and let's see if anyone has any questions for any members of the cast. Can I pick up something that you said earlier about chopping it up so that you're moving in and out of yeah. people's scripts and how how the actors felt about doing that because. It's quite interesting, you sort of get into something and then you're off doing something else and then you sort of pick that or whoever up again. Well, I just wonder how that felt rather than being able to sort of move straight through it. How? You start. Well, um, you, you have to realise eventually that it's just different. You know, it's not, it's not a play as, mm. as we know a play. And you get used to it, it's almost, I suppose, like doing review. You know, you, you have to have these characters in your head, but you just get glimpses of them. Um, but at least they do go through, like, like Pam and the Zumba class, you know, and her kind of breakdown and that. There is a line, and the same with, with um, Bella and Ruth, there is a line. But uh, it is in snatches. You just have to keep that in your head, you know, the line. And um, when we rehearse them, we, are, we, we would, re where there are repeating, uh, or where there are things that we revisit, we would rehearse them as one In block, block yeah. so that you actually had some sense of mm. the beginning, the middle, and the yeah. end, and then it was just a case of, oh right, you get to that point, yeah. and then you I pick up where you left off. Sorry? Vision. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. and that's, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, for anybody who wants to know the, you know, much of, where the play goes, um, find Steve Marmion at some point, because you know what what became increasingly frustrating is I was able to make some very severe cuts very early on, and yet Steve would go, "No, you can't cut that," and I'd be like, "Well, why? You know, well, you know, it's a thing. Well, what thing? That's oh, part of the bigger thing. Well, what's that bigger thing?" And then you see it on the set, and you see it with the colours, and then you see it with this, and then you know it comes on the back of that, and then you know that somebody already said that, and you're like, well, you could never have cut that in a million years, you know. It's, so that, that there's, a, there's a, a big, you know, like those old uh, telephone uh, like directories where there's those women pulling out wires and connecting to something else all the time. Uh, Steve did a lot of that, and I think that chopping up. Um, was was really as much of him knowing that there would be another wire coming off that into something else of that as well. Mm -hmm. so and it's, it's, still, trust in and it. it's still happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. It's an ongoing it's thing. Still, it's still evolving. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Oh, yes. oh, oh. The first show we did is now completely different to what show that whoever yeah. was watching. Mm -hmm. And we only started on Wednesday. Yeah. We only started. <laughs> if you if you came on Wednesday, you actually saw. I think almost a three-hour play. Yeah. So. Not now. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll come, we'll come back on the last night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You'll be here for yeah, ten yeah. minutes. <laughs> yeah. Ten minutes. Yeah. But I, but I always like that about about theatre. I think if it is fresh, if it is organic, if it is growing constantly. I mean, we did the Pitman Painters for many, many years, but it was always Lee, the writer of that play. Uh, we had new cast. We were always looking to improve it and to enhance it and to, to embell embellish it and nuance it. And I think that is, that is another thing that I like about the way Steve works, is that it is, it's live, that's why we're called live theatre, it is live, it is happening in front of you. And you, the audience, are the other vital component mm -hmm. that's denied to us in the rehearsal process. And so we get so far, I mean, the actors meet and we rehearse and we rehearse the lines, and then a whole gang of other people come along, the, the lighting designer, the sound designer, the video designer, the, uh, the choreographer, and they all come in uh, a period and, 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 and change it again. And then we rehearse it, and then we put it before an audience. And then when the audience 
gives their input just in the way that they're reacting to it, or even if the, the comments that they leave or, or snippets of conversation we hear in the bar afterwards, that affects our thinking too, and, and, bring, and we come back to the actors and we re-rehearse and, and, and change. And I think that's a really positive and interesting and healthy way to, to work. So, it, but that can't be overstated, I don't think, because sometimes you know, we're up here doing something and, and the reaction is different. Yeah, yeah. And it does change the whole way the rest of that scene goes from there on in. And, <laughs> you know, I think that's really magical. Yeah. Do you think that's especially so because the tables are so close to you that you get a very intimate connection? Uh, here specifically in this space? Yes. Um, I'm probably not best placed to answer that. You'd probably be better asking someone with more theatrical experience. Um, yeah, the thing is about this space is it's incredibly intimate, so there really is no hiding. Now, I've done a lot of plays where you ignore the audience and you put a nice little fourth wall and you can get on with your play, and, you know, and you, it is different every night because of the reaction, but especially with this one as we're encouraged to engage and, and look at you guys. And I remember the first night looking out and realising you were just there. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a lovely, yeah, but it's really lovely in fact, because yeah. I don't feel like we're on a television box far away uh, in the distance from you guys. It's, it's, you know, palpable what you guys are feeling and you can probably feel what we're feeling too. Yeah. So uh, as a space, it's really nice. And you don't feel like you have to reach the gods, you can just be on a level, especially with the more um, <coughs> naturalistic pieces, like uh, with Bella and Ruth and Pat, you can really bring it in and feel like you guys will come with us. So yeah. yeah. It is a very democratic space. All the all the actors that, that, that come here for the first time are, are a bit intimidated sometimes by the proximity. But then they, once they begin to play, they realise it is a very democratic house. Yeah. And and again, that's that's on purpose. We put we put cabaret seating here as well as the fixed seating to, to give it an informality and an, and an intimacy. Very, anyway, very bright. Yes indeed, very bright. <laughs> yeah. He would do he would do, yeah, he would do, <laughs> <laughs> he would do basic boxing rings. For I, I don't know if people aren't allowed to drink during the show because they didn't, I mean I've never heard any glasses clinking. People can drink. It's amazing show. because they, they don't they seem to be, you know. To access that, yeah. Really? I have, I have known yeah. that in the past. I, mean, I, I did wonder so far. because people have really been concentrating. <laughs> Just be careful on a Friday night sometimes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we had a guy the other night who did a bit too much. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Yeah. Would anyone else at, 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 that's what these lovely actors have questioned. Um, can I just, so just going back to what you were saying about theatre evolving? Um, it's funny because I noticed this T-shirt. We actually went to see Crows the Poorhouse Door at the Northern stage, stage. Yeah. and I know it was a co-production. Co-production, yeah. Um, and I have to say how impressed I was with the updates. Yeah. yeah. Um, it wasn't hugely different, but um, the the ending I found, I found very poignant because I also work at the pension centre, which basically is a call centre. I don't know No, no, no. But, um, and of course, that, that was built on what, is, what was Dawn Pit. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So it, it did bring that very yeah. much to all. No, I'm very, I'm very, I'm very proud that we currently have two shows uh, in production. One is, um, is touring, uh, Close the Cold House Door. It's been all around the country, which is a co-production. Uh, and, and this piece, and you couldn't see two more diverse and interesting pieces of theatre. Yet, at their heart, they both have that human. At their at their core, they have the the, the, the nature of the, of the human spirit. Anyway, more questions for some of these lovely actors, please. Or are we all done? Yes. What's the difference between actually working on telly rehearsal and working in the theatre rehearsal? Uh, <coughs> well, in TV and film, you know, if you get it wrong, you just think a cut and you just do it again, um, and that's fine. And for me, I think the biggest challenge has been holding this amount of information and this amount of dialogue. You know, it's what almost two, I don't know what our running time is, but um, yeah, it's not. It's a new because in, in film and TV, you might shoot um, four pages of di dialogue a day. And that's it, you know, and we're doing something that's this thick every night. Um, and also just, um, I think, I'm having to adjust to, I mean, my acting on TV and film is very naturalistic. 
Now, obviously, if someone's sitting right up there, they're not going to, you know, a camera's here and you can read what's going on in someone's eyes, and they can't from there. So it's, I'm trying to have, learning that I have to sort of adopt a slightly new way of moving, and you have to be slightly bigger to convey a message in theatre. It's very, it is a different technique, and I know, it, you know, they're both, it's both, a, it's acting. But it's almost, to me, it's like the difference between painting and watercolour or making a sculpture. Do you know, it's a, it's a very, very different skill and I feel very, you know, very much a novice at this. Mm. I, I'd just like to say about this actress again, that every one of these guys on this stage was actually put on this planet to be a performer. They have, you know, incredible natural theatrical instincts. And, and even the guys who've who've not been on stage before in, in this sort of context, their, their theatrical instincts are absolutely sublime. And again, I think audiences seeing that, that's another part of the overall equation. You see these guys do, they sing, they dance, and the, and the dancing, I have to say, it, it, it's been choreographed by Lee Proud, who's, who's worked with us, and he, who, who was the choreographer from Billy Elliot. And I love his choreography because it's delightfully fun and accessible, but it's quite intricate, isn't it, guys? <laughs> 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 Basically, if you said to Lee, we just need four steps to get them from there to there, there was suddenly a count of 16 with a backwards split face. Sell it, guys, sell it with love. No, Lee, I just, can I not just take four steps? No, we're going to do it this way. Fine. Two <laughs> days later, is this how it works? <laughs> but the, the big shock in the first week was one day when we did five hours of dance with me. Yeah. And, and I didn't know where I was. <laughs> to be fine. If you go backstage, you'll see lots of pieces of paper stuck to walls. <laughs> with and a lot running around to each other. With different individual handwriting, which sort of uh, mm. tries to explain. And I suppose in the early parts of rehearsals, I mean, I was sitting out front, but I could see through doors people. <laughs> yeah, there's, a lot yeah. of that. there's a lot of that. Yeah, how do you cope with all that? How do you cope with with that? lists? Yeah, <laughs> make, make lists, <laughs> and, and, and then the lists get changed. And <laughs> fantastic backstage people who yeah. oh, help fantastic. opening doors yeah. and close, and the amount of times I come off and yeah. just go, put me in something, dress me, and I'll go on as it. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, they're amazing. They're amazing stage managers. Yeah. 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 Why the set is and what all the things. So it doesn't have anything to do with anyone. No. It's basically more intrigued than coming in the scene. I mean, that's the thing about this show. I think, you know, it's, it's perfectly possible just to... In fact, we had a guy last night who came in and uh, we were talking to him in the bar afterwards and he went, I haven't got a clue what that's about, but I'm coming back to watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's yeah. yeah, it's a bit like... Uh, yeah. Anyone seen Donnie Darko? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right, that's a classic example to me of a thing that you watch and you get to the end of it and you go, I really, really enjoyed that. I haven't got a clue what that is about. Well, you, yeah, you're meant to be able to, but if you did, you're a wiser human being than I. <laughs> I think this, for, for, for the people who haven't seen this is no Donnie Darko. I think at the end of this you do find out, but um, yeah, I think that, that there's an intrigue to the it design all, and the, yeah. the costume and, the, and all of that that, that you know, I think really powers it along. I mean, it's an incredibly complex show to technically rehearse. Oh. I think... <laughs> it's, it's B, B, are you here? Yeah. How many cues are in your book? Uh, I'm talking to B, who is the d deputy stage manager, and her job is she has the script in front of her. B speaks more than we do. Yeah, and she has to cue every lighting cue, sound cue, AV cue, backstage to get people on cues, and... How many are there, B? Uh, there's 540 lighting cues. 540 lighting cues. <laughs> and only 200 sound. 200 sound cues. I'm not too sure about AV because they're all point cues and, and they're all over the place. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's about, there's about probably about 700 cues. So every night, B is in front of that book and she goes, and, and, and on the script will be uh, a, a line drawn under a particular word which goes to a particular discipline and she will be queuing it as, as we speak. 
700 queues in two hours. It's uh, it's quite a achievement. And I have to say that the, 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 the technical team it's here has been fantastic yeah. and uh, yeah. have, have, have helped make the experience uh, uh, joyous. And they're very cheerful. Yeah. Very cheerful. And they're very affordable. Regional <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, is that what it is? Uh, anyone else, guys? Anyone else? Yeah, can we ask, how did you arrive at the, in the, set, the basic set of costumes? And what are you doing before the show starts? So when you're I mean the, the costume, the basic clown costumes, yeah. the white costumes are representative of the holding form about which is Steve's uh, concept, brilliant concept, of these hopeless clowns, these or he calls them wise fools, mm -hmm. but ostensibly they are fools, but they are wise as we find out. And that they have been charged to tell the story, to explore the notion of utopia. So that's, what we, I suppose, what we call the holding for. And then was, what was added, I suppose, between Steve and the, and the, the designer would be uh, a colour concept. So each of the guys, yeah. you'll probably notice, has a colour. I think you'll see uh, Rufus's mad red face and Baby has a bit of yellow. Yeah, in fact, he even has a and yellow we have, chair. we have our own chairs. Yeah. yeah. Brown. And Sophia has uh, a, a lovely uh, purple sort of... Uh, costume that you occasionally see and then occasionally we have the trappings of naturalism so you will go off and put on a carer's coat and uh, but even that will be bluey blue. yeah, yeah, yeah even that's bluey so so to answer your question that's kind of the, the but concept. it goes even deeper than that yes. this is again sort of this is steve's telephone you know, thing is that the characters we then play in all of the different scenes have an odd commonality to them <laughs> that, that I don't think is colour coordinated in that you know red is danger and blue is cold or you know learning or whatever. I don't think it's that. I think you know the colours are just the colours. But each character that we then play in each sketch has has a sort of a the colours themselves. The wise fools themselves have a, a type of person that they then play. Going backwards and forwards, which is and the type of journey each yeah, I mean, takes with the characters that they put on as well. They learn through playing those characters as well, so they're not separate things. And it's interesting you ask about the very beginning as well in terms of the games that are being played, because even that has some meaning to it. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I've got a building a house of cards. It's it's about building something. And green is, you know, about moving people around and trying to plan something out. And brown is drawing, you know, mm. what, creating, and, and it's, uh, and, and the people, you know, surprising so anyone not doing anything, and, and she's then looking at all of those things and trying to tie them all together. And so, yeah, you know, it's <laughs> everything is dripping with with some meaning that you you think, you know. At some point, you must get to a stage where you just think, I'll oh, just fucking do a thing, it's fine. <laughs> it never happens, there's always got to be, no, it's, there's, a, there's a reason. There's always, always a reason. Yes? Um, I was, you were saying about um, how in the rehearsal process you uh, can be given, uh, you can be here from this, like, solid blocks of uh, individual pieces. I was just wondering, like, as performance, like, whether um, when you broke them up and they, they were interspersed like amongst themselves, but if they kind of influenced the universe, the, 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 like the characters or just the tones or whatever. Yeah, but, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just realised I was basically shouting all the time. I shouted as Frank to, be, <laughs> to make him as sort of bolshy and unpleasant as possible. And then I had this idea of basically doing Peter Dixon's voice the announcer of the X Factor as the director. And then there was something else I was basically just shouting and something else I was shouting and thought, I probably need to find a different texture. <laughs> <laughs> but you actually worked with Steve on, uh, and, and created the piece about uh, the, the Club Utopia piece. A bit, yeah. I mean, that, I mean, that, that for me is like the really, pa my personal favourite yeah. is because it's about the death of art. Yeah. And it's about the idea that if you had perfection, there, there, there could not be anything to express. You know, you, you actually need juxtaposition, you need light and shade. Yeah. And so, um, it's always, weirdly, it's always been my temptation. And if you, I'm not, this isn't a plug, but if you watch my stand-up DVD, 
There is a big, there's a big, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but there's a big, there's, there's a big chunk in the middle of, that's sort of, you know, it's about 20 minutes long, where I'm saying these aren't jokes. I'm not trying to be funny now. This is just me, and I really, I've always had that that idea theatrically, even with stand-up, that you, that that actually you can do something else with it a bit. And so when I, I mean, when Steve's concept, what well, is Steve's concept? That you know he's trying to make these people laugh and he can't because he they, they haven't got it's anything utopia. to respond to because it's yeah. utopia. That he ends up trying to sort of share with them his own misery at this. Yeah, I I I, I really like that. But I mean, it was it was him more than I. Right. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting piece and really again reflects the diversity of the of, of the whole experience. Um, Paul, are you looking at me as though no, we can have a look? <laughs> okay. I'm aware that these guys have done a show this afternoon and they've got to go and have a rest and a, maybe a little bite to eat. Uh, and so I'd, I'd just like to say thank you very much for coming and uh, thank you guys very much for giving up your time and sharing it with the, with the audience. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs>